Yo estoy. Good evening, friends. And as usual, when there's Mr. S.R. Somashekar, a former district judge from Bangalore, the people on the WhatsApp as well as on the YouTube are too glad that the knowledge is being shared by one of the best resourceful persons on our platform. And today's topic is withdrawal and compromise, what is construed and laid down under Order 23 of the CPC. On behalf of the team of Beyond Law CLC and Trikram and Associates, we welcome, sir. And as usual, these sessions of Mr. S. R. Somashekar are doing the best. And number one on our platform continues to be of the session being taken by Mr. S. R. Somashekar. And we are so proud and we feel so happy that he keeps accepting our invite and we believe that it will continue to happen so. And we are, as usual, too happy that there his son and his daughter-in-law always accede despite the holiday to agree to be remain at home so mm -hmm. that the knowledge can be shared. So on behalf of the team, we are too happy for that. And uh, we will request, sir, to share our obligation towards them. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Vikas Chatrat. And good evening to all the participants. <clears throat> The title to Order 23 first requires some explanation. It is Withdrawal and Adjustment of Suits. There is nothing like adjusting a suit. It is an adjustment between the parties which ultimately culminates in the disposal of the suit not by way of adjudication but by way of a settlement or compromise. It is an adjustment between the parties, which is in the nature of an agreement. It should be a lawful agreement. It should be voluntary. And in order 23 itself refers to it as compromise ultimately. Therefore, though the title given to order 23 in CPC is withdrawal and adjustment, I have chosen to put it as withdrawal and compromise only to enable the participants to know what exactly Order 23 contains and connotes. It has two parts. One part dealing with withdrawal, the other part dealing with compromise. We should be very clear about this. 23 Rule 1, Rule 1 capital A and Rule 2, 23 Rule 1, Rule 1 capital A and Rule 2, they deal with withdrawal. Rule 3, 3 capital A, 3 capital B deal with compromise. Rule 3, 3 capital A and 3 capital B deal with compromise. Rule 4 is applicable to both withdrawal and compromise. And it says that Order 23 does not apply to execution proceedings. So we can stop with Rule 3B. As most of you know, the Code of Civil Procedure was drastically amended in 1976. Act number 104 of 1976, which came into force on 1-2-1977. Probably everybody, including me on this platform, are all products of CPC, which came, which was amended by Act Number 104 of 1976. There is a reason to tell me as about the significance of this amendment. The title, as I see, is withdrawal. Two kinds of withdrawal were contemplated before the amendment. 
Number one, withdrawal simpliciter or withdrawal without a rider. The second one was withdrawal with liberty to file a fresh suit in respect of the same subject matter. Withdrawal simpliciter or withdrawal without a rider. Second, withdrawal with liberty to file a fresh suit in respect to the same subject matter. So, since two expressions were used for both the situations, withdrawal and withdrawal with a rider, in 1976, the new expression was used that withdrawal simpliciter was replaced by abandonment. I always jocularly tell that the word withdrawal itself was abandoned, rather it was withdrawn by the 1976 amendment. What we, the word used now is abandonment. Abandonment of the suit. That abandonment of the suit or the claim is the same thing as withdrawal simpliciter as it existed prior to 1976, uh, 1976 amendment. Straight away, I would take the audience to a judgment of Honorable Justice E. S. Venkat Ramayya in, reported in 1987, 1 SCC, page 5. 1987, 1 SCC, page 5. Party's name I'm avoiding because it takes a good lot of time to cite the names of the parties. In para 5 of this judgment, his lordship has explained the distinction or difference that is brought out by this 1976 amendment in order 23 rule 1. What his lordship has stated is, since the earlier rule provided for two kinds of withdrawals, withdrawal simpliciter, and we try with a rider, that is with liberty to file a suit. Uh, two expressions for the same kind for different kinds of withdrawal was leading to some confusion. Therefore, the parliament thought it fit to replace the word with the trial by abandonment. This has been clarified by his lordship in this statement, which the participants may read. Now we will take up those rules. As I said, Rule 1, Rule 1A one and Rule 2, they deal with withdrawal. First, we'll take up withdrawal and then we will go to compromise. Rule 1. At any time, after the institution of a suit, the plaintiff may, as against all or any of the defendants, abandon his suit or abandon a part of his claim. See the marginal note to rule one. The marginal note to rule one is withdrawal of suit or abandonment of a part of claim. But in sub rule one of rule one, we don't find the use of the word withdrawal at all. We find it abandonment. At any time after the institution of a suit, the plaintiff may, as against all or any of the defendants, abandon his suit or abandon a part of his claim. No permission of the court is required. Defendant can have no say in the matter. It is the plaintiff's right to abandon his suit. When a counsel files a memo saying, that he does not press the suit, it amounts to abandonment of the claim. No application is contemplated under Order 23, Rule 1, Sub Rule 1 for abandoning the claim. It is a matter of right. Court cannot ask the plaintiff as to why he is abandoning the claim. Court cannot ask the plaintiff why he is giving up his claim, why he is not pressing the suit. Defendant cannot oppose. Defendant cannot be given an opportunity by the plaintiff to file objections to this memo or application. Absolutely no written application is contemplated. Only for purposes of retard, 
a written memo should be sufficient request in the uh, not even requesting only to inform the court that the plaintiff is abandoning his claim this abandonment can be in respect of all the defendants or a few of them similarly in respect of the whole claim or a part of the claim supposing the suit is for recovery of a sum of rupees 10 lakhs plaintiff may say i abandon my claim in respect of 2 lakhs and restrict it only to 8 lakhs Court cannot question him. Defendant cannot question him. What is the right of the defendant? I will tell you. Similarly, suit is filed against a few one or two one or more defendants. Plaintiff may say, I don't press the suit against one of them or a few of them. What is its consequence? I'll tell you later. This is the right. Now, even before this amendment, as I said, the world used us with trial. So the law laid down in that regard before the amendment holds to this day. The earliest judgment at the point is AER 1968 Supreme Court 111. AER 1968 Supreme Court 111. In para 2 of this judgment, the Supreme Court has said, the language of Order 23, Rule 1, Subrule 1 gives an unqualified right to a plaintiff to withdraw from a suit and if no permission to file a fresh suit is sought under Subrule 2 of that rule, plaintiff becomes liable for such costs as the court may award and becomes precluded from instituting any fresh suit in respect of that set matter under Subrule 3 of that rule. There is no provision in the Code of Civil Procedure which requires the court to refuse permission to withdraw the suit in such circumstances and to compel the plaintiff to proceed with it. It is of course possible that different considerations may arise when a set-off may have been claimed under Order 8 or a counterclaim may have been filed, if permissible by the procedural law applicable to the proceedings found in the suit. Of course, if there is a set-off or counterclaim, suit will certainly be abandoned, withdrawn the defendant can proceed with the set of counter claim. So the only right the defendant has is to request the courts to award trust to him, he having been dragged on to the court unnecessarily. No other right. He may say, all right, it is his right, I have no problem, but I am entitled to trust. The court pay its discretion and trust. We have a fairly Latest judgment also on the point that is 2018, volume 12, SCC 584. 2018, volume 12, SCC 584. Para 18. Reading the part 23, rule 1 would go to show that the plaintiff has a right to file an application to abandon his claim. Of course, it says has right to file an application, as I said, no application is also contemplated or part thereof at any time after its filing. However, if the permission to withdraw the suit, whether full or part thereof, is granted under Rule 13, then the plaintiff would be granted liberty to institute a fresh suit on terms as the court may deem fit and proper. Then, para 23. In our considered opinion, when the plaintiff files an application under Order 23, Rule 1 and prays for permission to withdraw the suit, whether in full or part, he is always at liberty to do so, and in such case, the defendant has no right to raise any objection to such prayer being made by the plaintiff, except to ask for payment of the cards to him by the plaintiff as provided in sub Rule 4. Para 24. The reason is that while making prayer to withdraw the suit under Rule 1, sub Rule 1, the plaintiff does not ask for any leave to file a fresh suit on the same subject matter. A mere withdrawal of the suit, that is actually abandonment, without asking for anything more, can therefore be always permitted. In other words, the defendant has no right to compel the plaintiff to prosecute the suit by opposing the withdrawal of suit sought by the plaintiff, except to claim the cause for filing a suit against him. 
However, when the plaintiff applies for the trial of the suit, along with a prayer to grant him permission to file a fresh suit at the same subject matter, as provided in Subrule 3 of Rule 1, then in such event, the defendant can object to such prayer made by the plaintiff. In such event, it is for the court to decide as to whether the permission to seek with the trial of the suit should be granted to the plaintiff, and if so, on what terms as provided in Subrule 3 of Rule 1. Therefore, the main part of sub rule one of rule one of order twenty three makes it clear that it is the absolute right of the plaintiff to abandon his claim, entire claim or a part of the claim against all the defendants or a few of them. But law always has some exceptions. That exception is found in the proviso, <clears throat> provided that where the plaintiff is a minor or other person to whom the provisions contained in Rules 1 to 14 of Order 32 extend. The other person referred to in Order 32 is a person of unsound mind. Neither the suit nor any part of the claim shall be abandoned without the leave of the court. So, we should be very clear about this. If the plaintiff is a major, no permission of the court is required to abandon the claim or withdraw the suit. But, if the plaintiff is a minor or a person of unsound mind, then only permission of the court is required. Subrule 2. An application for leave under the proviso to subrule 1. You will have to carefully read subrule 2. An application for leave under the proviso to subrule 1. Under the main part of subrule 1, no application is contemplated. It is the right of the plaintiff to abandon his claim, to withdraw his suit. But in case of a minor plaintiff or a plaintiff who is of unsound mind, then an application seeking leave of the court to abandon the claim is required. An application for leave under the proviso to subrule 1 shall be accompanied by an affidavit of the next friend. And also, if a minor or such other person is represented by a pleader, by a certificate of the pleader to the effect that the abandonment proposed is in the opinion for the benefit of the minor or such other person. And I take a compromise, I will also draw your attention to the relevant provision in Order 32, which says that in the case of a compromise, if the parties are minors, then the leave of the court is required and a certificate of the pleader if the plaintiff or the defendant is represented by a pleader is also required. That We don't find a similar provision in Order 23 when it deals with compromise. As far as withdrawal is concerned, we have this. A verbatim reproduction of the same thing in Order 32, Rule 7, when it comes to compromise, where minors and persons of unsound mind are there. So now, I repeat, Subrule 1, rather, uh, Subrule 1 of Rule 1 of Order 23 contemplates withdrawal simpliciter, which in the language of CPC as amended in 1976, is only abandonment of the claim. Now go to sub rule 3. It contemplates withdrawal with permission to file a fresh suit in respect of the same subject matter. It is not same cause of action as many casually tell. I may be permitted to file a fresh suit in respect to the same cause of action. No. The language used in CPC is subject matter. We will read sub rule 3. It has two parts. Where the court is satisfied that a suit must fail by reason of some formal defect. Now, courts have held that this formal defect may be not issuing a statutory notice contemplated by CPC or some special enactment, the frame of the suit being incorrect, necessary parties being not implemented, some defect, a formal defect on account of which the suit will fail, even if the matter goes for trial, even if the plaintiff succeeds on establishing his claim, Ultimately, the suit has to be dismissed for an account of a formal defect. Therefore, the plaintiff must be given an opportunity to withdraw the suit and file a fresh suit in respect of the same subject matter, mark those words, not in respect of the same cause of action. 
So the first situation where the court can permit withdrawal with liberty to file a fresh suit in respect to the same subject matter is where there is a formal defect in the plaint which goes to the root of the matter and ultimately results in the failure of the suit, that is dismissal of the suit. Or it is not and or that there are sufficient grounds for allowing the plaintiff to institute a fresh suit for the subject matter of a suit or a part of a claim. So both these conditions need not be satisfied simultaneously. Even if there is no formal defect, if there are sufficient grounds for allowing the plaintiff to institute a fresh suit, the court may do it. This essentially depends upon the facts of each case. Some case law near about that. There have been decisions to the effect if the description of the properties is not correct and necessary parties are not implemented, so many amendments are required. Well, by, by amendment also the plight can be cured. If it ultimately is going to be totally cumbersome, uh, amending the entire plaint, impeding so many people, correcting the survey numbers, boundaries and all that, courts have taken the view that it is a sufficient ground for allowing the plaintiff to institute a fresh suit in respect of the same subject matter. Now, there was one question whether other sufficient grounds, other sufficient grounds, other sufficient grounds referred to in class B should be analogous to formal defect. In other words, should we read this expression sufficient ground, ejustum generis with formal defect. Karnataka High Court has taken a view that other sufficient grounds need not be analogous to formal defect. It could be anything other than formal defect. Uh, I know that the decision of the Karnataka High Court may not bind courts elsewhere in the country, but I find a few of my friends from Karnataka who have joined, and even otherwise, if this decision of the Karnataka High Court can persuade Judges outside Karnataka, there is nothing wrong in knowing the legal position. ILR 1968 Mysore 1003. ILR 1968 Mysore 1003. Uh, since it is a decision from uh, ILR of Mysore, I find it necessary to mention the parties' names also as far as this decision is concerned. This is Basappa Tippanna. Basappa Tippanna versus Bhimappa Ramappa. So, the Karnataka court has taken a view that sufficient grounds need not be analogous to formal defect. It need not be read ejustum generis with the expression formal defect. There could be other grounds also. So, now it is clear for simple withdrawal for our abandonment. No permission is required. Defendant cannot oppose. Court cannot raise an objection. The only right of the defendant is to press for cause. But under subrule 3, if it is withdrawal with liberty to file a fresh suit in respect of the same subject matter, not in respect of the same cause of action, plaintiff has to make out a case. Either there must be a formal defect or there will be sufficient grounds. Well, of course, what are those sufficient grounds? It all depends upon the facts of the case, the view which the particular presiding judge takes. It all depends. We can't uh, give a an exhaustive list of those sufficient grounds. When an occasion arises, lawyers will have to go through case law commentaries, find out whether there are some sufficient grounds uh, which the court consider for permitting withdrawal. And if your case is somewhere near that, you can cite it profitably. Then what is the consequence? If a suit is abandoned, subrule 4. Ah, before that, I want to tell you one thing. Now, subrule 1 contemplates withdrawal simpliciter. 
Sabrul three contemplates with trial with liberty to file a fresh suit in respect to the same subject matter. Now, when an application is filed by the plaintiff under subrule 3 for permission to withdraw the suit with liberty to file a fresh suit in respect to the same subject matter, experience has shown that the counsel for the defendant would submit that he has no objection for withdrawal, but permission should not be given to institute a fresh suit in respect to the same subject matter. Karnataka High Court has taken a view that the prayer cannot be split up. Either the application has to be totally rejected or totally allowed. The court cannot say, I will permit the plaintiff to withdraw, but I don't give permission to file a fresh suit in respect to the same subject matter. If he does not want permission, subrule 1, mere abandonment. Under subrule 3, when an application is made by the plaintiff seeking withdrawal with liberty to file a fresh suit in respect of the same subject matter, if the court finds that there is no formal defect, there are no sufficient grounds, it has to reject the application. On the other hand, if it finds that there is a formal defect, absolutely it has to allow withdrawal with liberty to file a fresh suit. Even if there is no formal defect, if there are sufficient grounds, it has to allow. The court cannot partly reject and partly allow the application. Uh, we have a good number of decisions for the Karnataka High Court on this point. As I said, uh, since there are participants from Karnataka, and of course they may be knowing it already, but still I would like to bring to their notice those decisions of the Karnataka High Court on the point. ILR 1974 Karnataka 814. ILR 1974 Karnataka 814. Bhuta versus Babu Rao. Bhuta versus Babu Rao. Then, ILR 1999, ILR 1991, Karnataka, 3991. ILR 1991, Karnataka, 3991. Shivakumara Swami versus Lingappa. Those of you who have a flair for English language will please read this statement. It is by Justice P.K. Shamsundar of the Karnataka High Court. He is no more. The very first sentence reads like this. Clearly, the court has committed a fox pass in passing the impugned order under which it permits the petitioner to withdraw the suit while refusing the prayer to renew the suit on the same cause of action. So that's how the judgment reads. Now, what's the consequence of abandonment? Order 23, Rule 1, Sub Rule 4, where the plaintiff abandons any suit or part to the claim under sub rule 1 or withdraws from a suit or a part of a claim without the permission referred to in sub rule 3. What is the consequence? He shall be liable for such cost as the court may award and shall be precluded from instituting any fresh suit in respect of sub subject matter or such part to the claim. So when the plaintiff abandons the suit, he cannot file a fresh suit. If he withdraws the suit without the permission of the court, he cannot file a fresh suit in respect to the same subject matter. And as I said, he is liable to pay costs. Subrule 5. Nothing in this rule shall be deemed to authorize the court to permit one of the several plaintiffs to abandon a suit or part of a claim under subrule 1 or to withdraw under subrule 3 any suit or part of a claim without the consent of the other plaintiffs. But if there are more than one plaintiff, then the consent of the other of the co-plaintiffs is required either for abandonment of the claim or for withdrawal of the suit with liberty to file a fresh suit in respect of the same subject matter. Then, Rule 1A. Where a suit is withdrawn, 
are abandoned by a plaintiff under Rule 1 and a defendant applies to be transposed as a plaintiff under Rule 10 of Order 1, the court shall, in considering such application, have due regard to the question whether the applicant has a substantial question to be decided as against any of the other defendants. Maybe a partition suit where certainly one of the defendants has some thing to be decided as against the other defendants. So it is a clear case where the court has to permit transposition of one of those defendants to the position of the plaintiff. Then rule 2. In any fresh suit instituted on permission granted under the last preceding rule, the plaintiff shall be bound by the law of limitation in the same manner as if the first suit had not been instituted. Therefore, advocates while seeking permission to withdraw the first suit with liberty to file a fresh suit will think twice before making such application. The reason is, if you file a second suit, it should also be in time and the time runs from the date provided for the first suit. You can't say cause of action for the second suit arose when the court permitted withdrawal. No, that's not the correct position. So therefore, the second suit should be within the time provided by the limitation act for the first suit. So lawyers will have to be extremely careful while making an application under Order 23, Rule 1, Sub Rule 3, seeking withdrawal with liberty to file a fresh suit in respect to the same subject matter. Because if you do not apply your mind at that stage to the question of limitation, and the court grants permission, merely because permission is given, the fresh suit will not be in time. I repeat, you can't say, cause of action for the second suit arose after the first suit was withdrawn, court gave permission, it is in time, no. A suit will not be in time because we think that it is in time. A suit can be in time only when the suit is filed within the time mentioned in the last column of the Schedule to the Limitation Act. Please be very clear about it. So, before making an application for withdrawal with liberty to file a fresh suit, ensure yourself that the fresh suit will be within time. So, these are provisions which relate to withdrawal of the suit. Now, we will refer to provisions relating to compromise. <coughs> As I said, Rule 3, Rule 3A and Rule 3B, they relate with compromise. Rule 3. Where it is proved to the satisfaction of the court that a suit has been adjusted wholly. Here you get the word adjust. Therefore, the title to Order 23 is Withdrawal and Adjustment. As I said, I have deliberately changed the title for this platform as Withdrawal and Compromise because people usually say compromise. The word adjustment is found in Rule 3. Where it is proved, this proof is not by rhetoric evidence. <coughs> where it is proved to the satisfaction of the court, this proof the court gets by questioning both the parties. Well, have you entered into this compromise? Is it voluntary? The court has to put searching questions to satisfy itself that the parties have really entered into a compromise. Here the court also has got an obligation. Merely because the suit gets disposed of, the court should not say that I am satisfied that the compromise is voluntary. Court should use its uh, innate common sense and question the parties whether there is really a compromise. Where it is proved <coughs> to the satisfaction of the court that a suit has been adjusted wholly or in part by any lawful agreement or compromise. This is extremely important. It should be by way of a lawful agreement which has been entered into prior to making the application for a compromise or a compromise in writing and signed by the parties. So both the parties will have to sign or where the defendant satisfies the plaintiff in respect to the whole or any part of the subject matter of the suit. Suit is for recovery of money. The defendant pays the entire money or a part of the money. Suit is for specific performance in respect of two or more profit fees. 
in respect of one property has executed a sale deed after filing of this. <clears throat> the court shall order such agreement, compromise or satisfaction to be retarded and shall pass a decree in accordance where with. What the courts have held is this compromise is an agreement between the parties. If the court is satisfied that the compromise is voluntary and lawful, it accepts it. It is the court putting its seal of approval to the agreement arrived between the parties. In technical language, it is called imprimatur. The court gives its imprimatur. Shall order in accordance therewith and shall pass a decree in accordance therewith so far as it relates to the parties to the suit. This is extremely important. This compromise can only be in respect of party, in respect of persons who are parties to the suit. A third person is not bound by this compromise. And whether or not the subject matter of the agreement, compromise or satisfaction is the same as the subject matter of the suit. This is an amendment brought by this Act No. 104 of 1976. Prior to amendment, any compromise under Art 23, Rule 3 could only be in respect of the subject matter of the suit. Maybe experience of the courts and lawyers showed that if some other property not included in the suit is also included, there are chances of settlement by this amendment. The parties are now permitted to include some property which was not earlier included in the plaint. Here, there is no need to amend the plaint under Order 6, Rule 17 to uh, formally include that property because Order 23, Rule 3 itself provides that there can be a compromise in respect of a property which was not the subject matter of the suit earlier. The reason is this. Let us say suit is filed in respect of four acres of land in a particular survey number. Parties enter into a compromise. The defendant says, all right, you give two acres in the suit survey number to me. I will give two acres in my property which is adjacent to your property on the eastern side so that you can have a compact plan. So now this compromise is permissible, I mean possible, or the defendant agrees for that compromise only when a portion of the suit property is given to him. Plaintiff is also agreeable because he gets some property which belongs to the defendant. But it was not the subject matter of the suit or some other property. Therefore, maybe based on experience, in order to see that the parties arrive at a settlement and once for all get the matter settled, when CPC was amended in 1976, the code provided for inclusion of a property at the time of compromise, which is not the subject matter of the suit. No application under Order 6, Rule 17 CPC is required for amendment of the plaint to include this property in the compromise petition that can be done. <coughs> then, let us see the proviso to Rule 3. Provided that where it is alleged by one party and denied by the other that an adjustment or satisfaction has been arrived at, the court shall decide the question. But no adjournment shall be granted for the purpose of deciding the question unless the court, for reasons to be retarded, thinks fit to grant such adjournment. Sometimes what happens is, plaintiff or the defendant comes to the court with an application under Order 23, Rule 3, CPC saying that the matter is compromised. The other side says, no, there is no compromise at all. It is quite possible that he has also signed. Unwillingly he has signed. Not knowing the contents he has signed. His signature might have been taken by force or by some kind of a persuasion. Therefore, or he might not have. Therefore, it is quite possible in such a situation, one of the parties may represent to the court that he is not agreeable for a settlement, that there is actually no settlement at all. So one party says that we have compromised. 
The other party says that there is no compromise. What is it that the court should do? The court shall decide the question of what? Whether there has been a compromise or not. It cannot go into the merits of the case. Whose case is strong? No. It has only to decide that limited question whether it whether there has been a compromise. Well, it does. It may not contemplate an inquiry or retarding of formal evidence. Well, the court will have to put a serious questions to both the parties. If by that nothing turns out, maybe the parties will have to be put into the witness box, ask them to take oath. Court may also court cannot cross examine. Court may have to put some certain questions to know the truth whether there has been a real compromise or not. It also says, no adjournment shall be granted. So, I will hold this inquiry tomorrow. No. As far as possible, that inquiry, whether there has been a compromise or not, has to be done on the same day. But if it cannot be done, the court has to give reasons as to why it cannot be done on that day and then adjourn the matter. Then what is this agreement or compromise? Explanation. An agreement or compromise which is void or voidable under the Indian Contract Act shall not be deemed to be lawful within the meaning of this rule. Now, Section 10 of the Indian Contract Act says, all agreements or contracts provided they are made by the free consent of parties, competent to contract, for a lawful consideration and for a lawful object and are not expressly declared to be void by the provisions of the Contract Act. That is how Section 10 of the Contract Act reads. So, it must be by free consent of the parties. It should be for a lawful consideration. That consent is also defined in Section 13. Free consent is also defined in 14. Free consent means consent not obtained by coercion as defined under 50. Then undue influence as defined under Section 16. Fraud as defined under Section 17, misrepresentation as defined under 18, mistake as defined under Section 20. So, all those factors the courts and the lawyers will have to keep in mind when they report compromise or when the compromise is accepted. It has to be lawful and the added uh, factor is it should be voluntary. That is why it says free consent of parties. Here, lawyers owe a duty to the court. Experience has shown <clears throat> to overcome some laws. Some states would have imposed a ban on registration of some documents for some reason. In the state of Karnataka, for about uh, six or seven years, we had a law in force, Karnataka Prevention of Fragmentation and Consolidation of Holdings Act. It was later repealed. The government thought that poor agriculturists with lesser extent of land were forced to sell the land for some financial need. Government said it would result in fragmentation and it is improper. They gave a schedule also. Wetland, this should be the extent. Dry land, this should be the extent. The extent in some areas is this and all that. Now, what used to happen is, because of that bar under that act, there could not have been a sale deed. Where there could not have been a sale deed, there could not have been registration. So, parties to overcome that, they would file a suit, declare that I am the owner of the suit schedule property. Defendant would come and say, I have no objection. They have entered into a compromise. In such a situation, the court will have to be extremely careful in accepting such a compromise. May I draw your attention to <clears throat> Section 58 of the Evidence Act in this context. No fact need be proved in any proceeding which the parties thereto or their agents agree to admit at the hearing, or which before the hearing they agree to admit by any writing under their hands, or which by any rule of pleading in force at the time they are deemed to have admitted by their pleadings, provided that the court may its decision require the facts admitted to be proved, otherwise than by such admissions. 
we have almost a reproduction of this proviso to section 58 of the evidence act in order 8 rule 5 ppc order 8 rule 5 <coughs> specific denial every allegation of fact in the plaint if not denied specifically or by necessary implication are stated to be not admitted in the pleading of the defense shall be taken to be admitted except as against a person under disability, provided that the court may in its discretion require any facts so admitted to be proved otherwise than by such admission. So, in 1872 itself, the framers of the Indian evidence had thought that there could be such situations and the court should have discretion not to decree a suit merely because the defendant had admitted the claim. Let me see which is the corresponding section in the Bharata Sashya Dhinayama 2023, which is yet to come into force. It is section 53 in the Bharata Sashya Dhinayama. 58 is the old section. Let me also read section 53 and see whether there is any change in the language. <coughs> Section 53 of Bharata Sashya Rajiniyan, which is yet to be notified. No fact needs to be proved in any proceeding, same thing, provided that the court may its discretion require the facts admitted to be proved. So there is absolutely no change as far as Section 58 of the Evidence Act of 1872 is concerned in this regard. Well, there are a good number of situations where both the lawyers should be careful, particularly in the advocates. And they also owe a duty to the court and to the society and to their own clients in this regard. Now, as all of you know, Hindu Marriage Act prohibits bigamy. A government official or an official of some bank or LIC or something has shown one ex as his wife and as the nominee to receive the benefits. While in service, he dies. The nominee yet goes to the authorities concerned, represents herself to be the legally wedded wife of that man, claims benefit. By then, some other woman would have already gone and saying, I have come to know that Mr. Yet has been shown as the nominee. She is claiming herself to be the legally wedded wife of this uh, man. In fact, she is not the legally wedded wife. I am the legally wedded wife. She is a second wife or a, a woman with whom my husband had some kind of a relationship. Absolutely, she doesn't have any legal status. Or the mother of that man may go to the authorities concerned saying, my son was never married at all. Some woman claiming to be his wife has come forward to uh, take the money. Now the authorities concerned, they say, you bring a declaration from the court that you are the legally wedded by that man. What this woman gets, the nominee does is, she files a suit for a declaration. She makes her children as defendants. This woman yet files a declaration that she is illegally wedded by the deceased. Who are the defendants in that suit? Her own children. They file a written statement saying, well, it is true that X is the plaintiff, X is our mother. It is true that she is the legally wedded wife of so and so. It is true that we are his legitimate children. There is absolutely no objection for decree in this suit. Order 12 says when there is an admission, the court can act on that admission and pass a decree. Order 8, Rule 5 says when there is no denial, the court can proceed. Section 58 of the evidence that says admitted facts need not be proved. But the proviso to Order 8, Rule 5, the proviso to section 58 provide that the court may in its discretion call for proof of it. Order 12, the court is not bound to decree a suit on mere admission. The court has to be careful whether that admission is voluntary, lawful, whether there is a clear admission, an unequivocal admission. Now, this is a case where the court is perfectly justified in invoking its power under the proviso to section 58 of the Evidence Act and uh, similar provision 
proviso under order 8 rule 5 as i said the court cannot cross examine court has to put the plaintiff to witness parts you claim to be illegally wedded by your pets please let me know the name of your mother in law or the father in law your husband's brother when did you get married is there any proof for that at one stage she may at least say well my mother in law is alive she is a class 1 year can there be a declaration that she is the only legal heir or her children are the legal heir well despite such exercise the court may not it may not be possible for the court to elicit all truths no but the court is required to do this lawyer should not find fault with such a court or a presiding officer who is true to his job who knows the law and serious about it well when i am giving consent why it is for the court to do all that no court has that duty to satisfy itself that there is a valid compromise and it is not a case where there is collusion <coughs> here itself please read section 44 of the evidence act the corresponding provision in this bharatiya shastra adhiniyama is 38 and section 44 for the indian evidence act now we have a group of sections commencing from section 40 and ending with 44 in the evidence act under the head judgments of courts of justice when relevant section 40 says well if there is already a judgment in an earlier suit because of the principles of rest judicata a fresh suit is barred if a trial has already taken place in a criminal case, either acquitting the accused or convicting the accused, a second prosecution is prohibited both under Article 20 of the Constitution and Section 300 of CRPC, atrophies, acquit or convict. 41 says, judgments given by probate courts, matrimonial courts, insolvency courts, and virality courts are judgments in REM. What is declared there is conclusive proof. 42 and 43 are not relevant for our discussion. 44. Any party to a suit or other proceeding may show that any judgment or order or decree which is relevant under 40, 41 or 42 and which has been proved by the adverse party was delivered by a court not competent to deliver it. I will come to that not competent to deliver it a little later or is obtained by fraud or by pollution. Therefore, the court have also got a duty to see before accepting a compromise whether there is really any fraud played on the on the court or on the opponent and whether there has been collusion in that regard. Many times it is done to overcome the provisions of the registration act, to overcome payment of stamp duty or a clear case of collusion, property belonging to someone. There is nothing wrong if the court insists on the plaintiff and the parties and the defendants to produce documents to show the title. Plaintiff simply files a suit, declare that I have perfected my title to the suit property by adverse possession. Of course, such a suit is perfectly maintainable now in the law declared by the Supreme Court. Defendant says, I have no objection. What if the property belongs to... It is true that this compromise does not bind a third party. But even then, at that stage, if the court applies its mind to and examines whether it is a case of pollution or not, a further litigation can be prevented Innocent persons who are not parties to this litigation are in no way harassed. Otherwise, they will have to file. It is true that this decree does not bind them. Uh, but yet you see why he should be forced to litigate before the court. So this is a duty which the lawyers owe to the society. Lawyers owe to the court. This is a duty which the judge owes to himself to protect the dignity of the court, to protect innocent persons. <clears throat> Then, Rule 3a, bar to suit. No suit shall lie to set aside a decree on the ground that the compromise on which the decree is based was not lawful. So, there cannot be a suit to set aside a decree, a compromise decree on the ground that it is not lawful. What is the remedy? It takes a little time for me to explain that. I will come to it a little later. Let me complete the statutory provisions. A suit does not claim. Of course, law has grown in this regard. It requires some detailed explanation. I will do it with reference to case law. Then Rule 3b. No agreement or compromise to be entered in a representative without the leave of the court. 
No agreement or compromise in a representative suit shall be entered into without the leave of the court, expressly recorded in the proceedings, and any such agreement or compromise entered into without the leave of the court, so recorded, shall be void. So, in the case of a representative suit, permission of the court is required for entering into a compromise. Before granting such leave, the court shall give notice in such manner as it may think fit to such persons as may appear to it to be interested in such suit. They may not be parties to the suit, but the court thinks, well, several other persons are going to be affected by this compromise. Let me also hear them. The court will have to issue notice to them. What is this representative suit? Not just order 1 rule 8. Explanation. In this rule, representative suit means a suit under section 91 or 92. 91 public nuisance, 92 with uh, trust matters. <clears throat> 91 public nuisance, 92 public charities. A suit under rule 8 of all rule. A suit in which the manager of an undivided Hindu family is used or is sued as representing the other members of the family, that is the Karta, the giant Hindu family. Any other suit in which the decree passed may, by virtue of the provisions of this court or of any other law for the time being in force, bind any person who is not named as a party to the suit. These are all representative suits. In such situations, the courts will have to be extremely careful in permitting compromise and an application is contemplated there. Here itself, let me refer to Order 32 Rule 7. I already told you, in the case of withdrawal where the plaintiff is a minor, uh, this uh, rule, sub rule 2 of Rule 1 provides that there should be an affidavit of the next friend to the effect that the compromise is for the benefit of the minor and if the minor is represented by a pleader, a certificate. As far as compromise is concerned, that is not contained in Order 23, it is contained in Order 32 Rule 7. Please go to Order 32 Rule 7. Sub Rule 1. No next friend or guardian for the suit shall, without the leave of the court, expressly retarded in the proceedings, enter into an agreement or compromise on behalf of a minor with reference to the suit in which he acts as next friend or guardian. Sub Rule 1A. An application for leave under Sub Rule 1 shall be accompanied by an affidavit of the next friend or the guardian for the suit as the case may be, and also the minor is expressed is represented by a pleader, by the certificate of the pleader, to the effect that the agreement or compromise proposed is in the opinion for the benefit of the minor. It is in fact almost a reproduction of sub rule 2 of rule 1 of order 23. Provided that the opinion so expressed, whether the affidavit or the certificate, shall not the court from examining whether the agreement or compromise proposed is for the benefit of the minor. Despite the next friend or the guardian filing an affidavit that it is in the interest of the minor, it is for the benefit of the minor, despite the pleader giving that certificate, court is still has, the court still has that power to examine whether the agreement or compromise is really for the benefit of the minor. Any such agreement or compromise entered into without the leave of the court so retarded shall be voidable against all parties other than the minor. <clears throat> Since uh, Order 32 deals with uh, suits by or against minors and persons of unsolved mind, this uh, Rule 7 regarding permission of the court certificate of pleader, all that is mentioned there. As far as withdrawal, we find a similar rule in Order 23, Rule 1. Now, there are a few other things not directly found in the statute, mostly covered by case law. And I would take it with reference to those case laws. Now, we have seen under Order 23, Rule 3, there can be a compromise in respect of a part of the claim, as in respect of a few of the defendants only. But here, Lawyers and judges will have to be careful, particularly in partition suits. If some of the parties only enter into a compromise, well, the court may mention in the order sheet, well, the parties have come up with this compromise. Compromise is read over to them. They agree that there is a compromise. 
my advice is not to pass any order on that compromise petition because if it is a partition suit, the other defendants, the other parties also have a right in the property. Supposing plaintiff and defendant enter into a compromise and say that item number one shall go to defendant or plaintiff. If the other items are all worthless, they are not valuable properties, the other defendants are going to be affected. Therefore, it is not proper to act on such a to pass an order on that compromise immediately and pass a decree in respect of the parties who have entered into a compromise. All this is not available in the statute. All this you will gain from your experience as lawyers and as judicial officers. What would be this effect? But there may be a case where there could be a compromise in respect of a part of the claim or in respect of a few of the properties, in respect of a few of the defendants, because it may not ultimately affect the other defendants. Well, it all depends upon a given case. Now, therefore, this partial compromise is permitted. Well, the statute itself is clear. You may also refer to 1924. Volume 1, SCC 567, <clears throat> 1974, Volume 1, SCC 567, or 23 Rule 3, para 59 of this statement, or 23 Rule 3 not only permits a partial compromise and adjustment of a suit by a lawful agreement, but further gives a mandate to the court to retard it and pass a decree in terms of such compromise and adjustment. Supposing the court is convinced, well, there can be a compromise in respect of a few of the parties, in respect of some of the parties, it is lawful. The other defendants are not going to be affected. The other parties are not going to be affected. It will pass a compromise decree. In respect of the parties who have not compromised, in respect of properties about which there is no compromise, the court has to proceed for trial. There will be two decrees in such a situation. One a decree by consent, Another decree after contest. So there is nothing wrong in passing two decrees. In this regard, we may refer to 1970, Volume 3, SCC 124. 1970, Volume 3, SCC 124. <clears throat> On the other hand, Rule 3 of Order 23 clearly enunciates a decree being passed in respect of a part of the subject matter. <clears throat> And Rule 6 of Order 12 permits the passage of a judgment at any stage without waiting for determination of other questions. Thus, it is clear that in the same suit, there can be more than one decree passed at different stages. So, as I said, one a decree by consent and another after contest. This is another thing which we are required, which we are required to remember. Then, there is one other aspect uh, which has Coming to Order 23, Rule 3A, before that, there is a small thing which I want to clarify here. Whether a compromise decree requires registration is another question which has been bothering the legal fraternity. The whole problem with some of us is we presume the legal position and we assert that that is the correct position and we think that our presumptions are irrebuttable. They are in fact conclusive proof. Many times our presumptions are rebutted by the statute itself. First, let us be very clear about this fundamental. Do, let us not go by some stray decisions here and there or in some case some view is taken, some presiding officer of some court where you have practiced or some advocate making some submission, the court accepting it. Let us not go by that. Let us go by the statute law first. To my knowledge, we have only two enactments which say which of those documents which require registration? One of those enactments, as already as all of you know, is the Registration Act. The other enactment is the Transfer of Property Act. In fact, you will be surprised to know that the Registration Act, there is no specific provision which says 
that a sale deed in respect of a property worth more than rupees 100 requires registration. It is contained in the Transfer of Property Act. By a process of interpretation of 17.1a of the Registration Act, we can say that a sale deed in respect of a property worth more than rupees 100 requires registration because it declares a title, it creates title. But specifically, it is covered by the Transfer of Property Act. So whenever lawyers and judges have a doubt whether a particular document requires registration, let us not presume anything. Let us not trust our memory. Let us not proceed on the basis that our presumption is irrebuttable. Our presumption is rebuttable. It is rebutted by the statutes themselves. Which are those statutes? The Registration Act and the Transfer of Property Act. Obviously, compromise does not find a place in the Transfer of Property Act. We will leave it for, uh, for the present. We will go to the Registration Act. 17 subsection 1 of the Registration Act refers to a list of documents which require compulsory registration. As lawyers, when you are required to give opinion to your clients or file a suit or make a submission in the court, if you are in doubt whether this document requires registration or something, please, if it is a document or a transaction covered by the TP Act, go to the TP Act. Otherwise, refer to the registration Act. Of course, in respect of something, there is that overlap. 17 subsection 1 of the Registration Act refers to five documents which require compulsory registration. This compromise decree does not find a place in any one of those classes A to E. I don't read A to E because it deals with altogether a different aspect of the matter. Then, subsection 1A. I had had my say about subsection 1A umpteen times on this platform and I don't want to repeat it. I will leave it there. Subsection 2 is an exception to 17.1b and 17c. Whatever might be stated in 17.1b and c, in respect of documents mentioned in section 72, registration is not compulsory. Then 17 subsection 3 also speaks of a document which requires registration. There also we don't get this compromise decree. 18 gives a list of documents of which registration is optional. Law does not make it mandatory. If the parties wanted to get it registered, well, they can get it registered. Now, what about this compromise? 17.1 does not make it mandatory because it is not covered by it at all. 17.2. Let us have a look at 17.2. Nothing in classes B and C of subsection 1 applies to. What is this class B of 17.1? Other non-testamentary instruments which purport or operate to create, declare, resign, limit, extinguish, whether in present or in future, any right, title or interest, whether vested or contingent, or the value of 100 rupees and of course to or immobile property. Class C, non-testamentary instruments which acknowledge the receipt. So nothing in classes B and C applies to any composition deed. Composition deed is not compromise. Class 2, any instrument relating to shares in a giant stock company. Subclass 3, any debenture issued by any such company. 4. Any endorsement upon or transfer of any debenture issued by any such company. 5. Any document other than the document specified in subsection 1A, not itself creating, declaring, assigning, limiting, or extinguishing any right, title, or interest, or the value of 100 rupees and of course to or in immovable property, but merely creating a right to obtain another document. It is an element of sale. 6 is important. Please read it very carefully. Any decree or order of a court. So, a decree or an order of a court does not require registration. There is something in the brackets. Except a decree or order expressed to be made on a compromise. Let us not stop there. And comprising immobile property 
other than that which is the subject matter of the suit or proceeding. So a decree or an order of a court does not require registration. All compromise decrees do not require registration. But if a compromise decree is in respect of an immovable property, which is not the subject matter of the suit, then it requires registration. Let us be very clear about this. Why? Because we have seen Order 23, Rule 3 provides for a compromise in respect of a property other than the subject matter of the suit also. I repeatedly said, no application for amendment of the plaint under Order 6, Rule 17 to include that property but in the compromise petition that can be shown. So if the court accepts a compromise and passes a decree in respect of a property which is not the subject matter of the suit, then that compromise decree requires registration. Compromise decrees, all compromise decrees do not require registration. All decrees do not require registration. It is only a compromise decree in respect of a property which is not the subject matter of the suit that requires registration. Then the case law in this regard is in addition to what is stated here. Supposing under the compromise, a party for the first time gets a right in an immobile property or the value of more than rupees 100. He did not have a pre-existing right. He got that right only for the first time. Now let us take a partition suit or a suit for declaration of title. When they enter into a compromise, the defendant gives up his claim in respect of his own property to some extent in fair the plaintiff. It may be a suit for partition where that property is admittedly the self-acquisition of one of the defendants. Because of this compromise, for the first time, the plaintiff gets a right title in respect of a property over which he had no pre-existing right. By this compromise, for the first time, he gets a right. So the Supreme Court has held that in such an event, when for the first time the parties get a right under a compromise, in, re in respect of which they had no pre-existing right, such a decree requires registration. We have this 1995 5 SCC 709, 1995. 5 SCC 709, Bhup Singh versus Ram Singh. Bhup Singh versus Ram Singh. A very detailed discussion is made with regard to registration of a compromise decree. And in para 80, the legal position is summarized. Before that, I would like to read para 17 also. It would therefore be the duty of the court to examine in each case whether the parties have pre-existing right to the immobile property or whether under the order or decree of the court one party having the right title or interest therein agreed or suffered to extinguish the same and created right title or interest in presenting in immobile property or the value of rupees 100 or upholds in favor of the other party for the first time either by compromise or pretended consent. If latter be the position, the document is compulsorily registrable. Para 80. The legal position can, on the basis of the aforesaid discussion, be summarized as below. Compromise decree is bona fide in the sense that the compromise is not a device to obviate payment of stamp duty and frustrate the law relating to registration would not require registration. In a converse situation, it would require registration. If the compromise decree were to create for the first time right title or interest in immobile property the value of rupees 100 or upwards, then it would require registration. Of course, on facts, uh, this uh, decision was distinguished in Sobhde versus Rati Ram, 2006, 10 SCC 788. Of course, legal position is not changed. On facts, they said this would not apply. 2006, 10 SCC 788. Then we have a latest decision, 2021, 7 SEC 446. 2021, 7 SEC 446. This uh, 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 Bhup Singh is uh, followed. Some other decisions which were rendered in the 
meantime have also been followed in this decision. So a compromise decree requires which condition if it is in respect of a property which was not the subject matter of the suit or if for the first time the parties get a right to the property and they did not have a pre-existing right. Now back to this order 23 rule 3 a which bars a suit. This is extremely important because it is purely based on case law. Order 23 rule 3 a <clears throat> no suit shall lie to set aside a decree on the ground that the compromise on which the decree is based was not lawful. Maybe the parliament found that frivolous suits were filed even though the parties had voluntarily entered into a compromise. And therefore, the parliament thought it best to create a bar when CPC was amended in 1976. Now, there cannot be a suit to set aside a decree on the ground that the compromise on which the decree is based was not lawful. This is this 1976 amendment. Prior to this amendment, there is a provision in Order 43, Rule 1 M. Those lawyers practicing in the, in the appellate courts would be aware of Order 43, Rule 1 which provides for appeal against certain orders. Order 43 Rule 1 M is omitted by the 1976 amendment. 43 Rule 1 M is omitted by the 1976 amendment. Prior to 1976, Order 43 Rule 1 M provided for an appeal against an order. In Karnataka, we call it as miscellaneous appeal. I do not know how it is categorized or classified in other states. Before deletion, 43 Rule 1M provided for an appeal against an order retarding the refuse into retarded compromise. Now, one party says that there is a compromise. The other party says that there is no compromise. The court is satisfied that there is a compromise and passes it order decree. Or the court says that there is no compromise and therefore refuses to retard a compromise. On the order against the order passed by the court, either retarding a compromise or refusing to accept a compromise, a regular appeal did not lie. An appeal under order 43 rule 1 M lay. Now that has been deleted by this 1976 amendment. In its place, something else is provided in Order 43, Rule 1, Capital A, Sub Rule 2. Order 43, Rule 1, Capital A, right to challenge non appealable orders in appeal against decrees. Sub Rule 1, I am omitting because it is not necessary for today's discussion. I am reading Sub Rule 2. In an appeal against a decree passed in a suit after retarding a compromise or refusing to retard a compromise, it shall be open to the appellant to contest the decree on the ground that the compromise should or should not have been retarded. Please read this provision carefully. In the light of Order 43 Rule 1 M, which is deleted, Order 43 Rule 1 M provided for an appeal against an order refusing to accept a compromise or retarding a compromise. It was an appeal, it was not a decree there, it is that order and appeal could be filed. Now that is deleted. This 43 Rule 1 A 2, it it does not take the place of order 43 rule 1 m it does not provide for an appeal against an order refusing to retard a compromise or retarding a compromise what it says is the court refuses say no there is no compromise 
it proceeds to decide the set on merits. It is the de decree given on merits. An appeal lies under section 96, right with order 41. In that appeal, which is filed under section 96, right with order 41, rule 1, the appellant may say that it was already a compromise. The court did not accept the compromise. It was a valid compromise. It was a voluntary compromise, a lawful compromise. Yet the court did not accept the compromise. Now it has proceeded to uh, decide the suit on merits. And therefore, it can urge that ground there. It is not an appeal under Order 43 Rule 1. It cannot be filed as a miscellaneous appeal. A regular appeal under Section 96 read with Order 41 Rule 1. One of the grounds that can be urged in that regular appeal is there had already been a compromise. The court, though there was a compromise, it was voluntary, lawful, everything valid. The court did not accept the compromise and proceed to decree the suit. Here, Section 96.3 CPC also assumes relevance. <clears throat> 96.3 CPC. <clears throat> 96 says, it is uh, here for your information, what is provided by 96 is an appeal against a decree, not against a judgment. Though usually we say that it is an appeal against a judgment and decree passed by the trial court. In law, it is an appeal against a decree only. Uh, 96 sub rule 3, uh, 96 3, no 96 subsection 3 rather, no appeal shall lie from a decree passed by the court with the consent of parties. Uh, well, I have my own view as to what a consent decree and a compromise decree is, but uh, uh, my view is not the view that the Supreme Court has taken and therefore I can't uh, give my view. The Supreme Court has said, well, a compromise decree would also be a consent decree in terms of section 96.3 CPC and therefore 96.3 CPC is a bar to challenge a compromise decree by way of an appeal. All right, we'll accept the treatment of the Supreme Court. Now, what's the position? Rule 3A of order 23 bars a suit for filing a compromise. Order 43 rule 1M has been deleted to file an appeal against an order accepting regarding a compromise or refusing to accept a compromise. 96.3 bar CPC bars a regular appeal challenging a consent decree. Suit is barred, miscellaneous appeal is barred, regular appeal is barred. If a regular appeal is filed against that final against that judgment, one of the grounds could be compromise should have been accepted and the decree could have been passed on compromise. Therefore, the courts thought it fit to meet such a situation. We have that 151 CPC. 151 CPC could be invoked to file an application in the very court where the compromise petition was filed and the compromise was uh, accepted, challenging that compromise on the ground that it was not lawful. This is purely judgment law. So the remedy is under that. We have some three. Of course, there are a number of judgments in the Karnataka High Court. I am not dealing with them because uh, some two officers, judicial officers of Karnataka are on the line and uh, they are quite competent and they are aware of those decisions. And uh, they would themselves tell me as to what those decisions are. I will straight away go to the decisions of the Supreme Court of the point with us. We have a number of uh, participants outside Karnataka. <clears throat> 1993, 1 SEC 581. 1993, 1 SEC 581. Banwari Lal vs. Chando Devi. Banwari Lal vs. Chando Devi. Eight. Earlier, Order 43 Rule 1M, under Order 43 Rule 1M, 
an appeal was maintainable against an order under Rule 3 of Order 23 recording a refusing to record an agreement compromise or satisfaction. But by the amending the act aforesaid, the clause has been deleted. The result whereof is that now no appeal is maintainable against an order recording or refusing to record an agreement or compromise under Rule 3. Being conscious that the right of appeal against the order recording a compromise or refusing to record a compromise was being taken away, a new rule 1A has been added to order 43, which I have already read. Then, para 96, uh, para 9. Section 96.3 says that no appeal shall lie from a decree passed by the court with the consent of the parties. Rule 1A2 has been introduced saying that against a decree passed in a suit after recording a compromise, it shall be open to the appellant to contest the decree on the ground that the compromise should not have been recorded. When section 96.3 bars an appeal against a decree passed with the consent of the parties, it implies that such decree is valid and binding on the parties unless set aside by the procedure prescribed or available to the parties. One such remedy available was by filing the appeal under Order 43 Rule 1M. If the order recording the compromise was set aside, there was no necessity or occasion to file an appeal against the decree. Similarly, a suit used to be filed for setting aside such a decree on the ground that the decree is based on an invalid and illegal compromise, not binding on the plaintiff or the defendant. But after the amendments which have been introduced, neither an appeal against the order regarding a compromise nor remedy by way of filing a suit is available in cases covered by Rule 3A of Order 23. As such, a right has been given under Rule 1A2 of Part 43 to a party who challenges the recording of the compromise to question the validity thereof while preferring an appeal against the decree. 96.3 shall, shall not be a bar to such an appeal because 96.3 is applicable to cases where the factum of compromise or agreement is not in dispute. Because it is a concept. When the compromise itself is in dispute, 96.3 would not be a bar. Then, we have this 2006 5 SCC 566. 2006 5 SCC 566 Pushpa Devi Bhatat versus Rajender Singh. 2006 5 SCC 566 Pushpa Devi Bhatat versus Rajender Singh. Please read the judgment. It is a judgment of Justice R. V. Ravindran. Uh, the legal position is uh, clarified. Well, uh, as I have already as I have always said, in one of the paras, His Lordship Justice Ravindran would summarize the entire legal position. So you can just directly go to the para. Para 17 in the judgment. The position that emerges from the amended provisions of Part 23 can be summed up thus: Number one. No appeal is maintainable against a consent decree having regard to the specific bar contained in 96.3. No appeal is maintainable against the order of the court regarding the compromise or refusing to record a compromise in view of the deletion of Class M of Rule 1 of Order 43. No independent suit can be filed for setting aside a compromise decree on the ground that the compromise was not lawful in view of the bar contained in Rule 3A. A consent decree operates as an estoppel and is valid and binding unless it is set aside by the court which passed by the consent decree by an order on an application. Therefore, the only remedy available to a party to a consent decree to avoid such consent decree is to approach the court which recorded the compromise and made a decree in terms of it and establish that there is no compromise. In that event, the court which recorded the compromise will itself consider and decide the question as to whether there is a valid compromise or not. This is so because a consent decree, because a consent decree is nothing but a contract between the parties superimposed with the seal of approval of the court. The validity of a consent decree depends solely on the validity of the agreement or compromise on which it is made. Well, regarding the facts of this case, it is stated. And then, the other judgment is 2014 15 SCC 471. 2014 15 SCC 471. Rajanna versus Venkata Swami. Rajanna versus Venkata Swami. 
the next is 2020 volume 6 sec 629 2020 volume 6 sec 629 Triloti Nath Singh versus Anirudh Singh. Triloti Nath Singh versus Anirudh Singh. Well, some clarification is required in respect of this judgment. If we just simply read the head note of this decision or some lines here and there, one is really justified in getting an impression that even a stranger to the compromise, a person who was not a party to the suit, even he is barred from filing a suit say, saying that the compromise is not binding on him. This decision appears to give an indication that the bar under Order 23 Rule 3A is not confined only to the parties to the compromise, even a stranger is bound by it. The Karnataka High Court had an occasion to clarify this judgment. What appears is, in this trilogy in our scene, the person who filed the suit was claiming under a person who was a party to the earlier suit. He did not claim any independent title. It was in those circumstances the Honorable Supreme Court took the view that even a stranger is prevented from filing a suit under Order 23, Rule 3A. Because on first principles, a compromise can bind only the parties to the compromise, obviously, who are parties to the suit. It cannot bind third persons. Triloji Nath Singh, prima facie, appears to indicate a slightly different view. If we carefully read the facts of the case and clarification given by the Karnataka High Court in that regard, of course, I am aware that the Karnataka High Court decision can only persuade uh, other courts. But uh, if it can throw some light on us and persuade us, why not we accept it? The decision of the Karnataka High Court is an ILR 2021 Karnataka 338. ILR 2021 Karnataka 338, Srimati Sushila versus Vijay Kumar. Srimati Sushila versus Vijay Kumar. Uh, well, these uh, decisions in this uh, Banwari Lal Pushpa Devi have all been subsequently referred to in 2021 9 SCC 114. 2021 9 SCC 114. You will also refer to 2022 5 SCC 736. 2022 5 SCC 736 Sri Surya Developers and Promoters Sri Surya Developers and Promoters versus N Shailesh and others. These are some important decisions. Now, when the matters are referred to Lokadalat, under the Legal Services Authorities Act. Even the Lot Adalat is bound by the fundamental principles contained in Order 23, Rule 3. Lot Adalat should also be satisfied that the compromise is voluntary and lawful. The Legal Services Authorities Act requires a reference to Lot Adalat on a memo or application made by both the parties or if only one of them seeks a reference, the other party has to be heard. Or the court thinks that it is a fit case for settlement through Lothar Dalit. The court, before making the reference, has to hear both the parties. So before Lothar Dalit also, all these uh, requirements are to be followed. We have 2006 8 SCC 364. 2006 8 SCC 364. 2008, 2SCC 660. 2008, 2SCC 660. Again, a judgment of Justice R. V. Ravindran. In 2009, 2SCC 198. 2009, 2SCC 198. Well, 
I have some thinking in this regard. I am not battered by any decision. I will leave it to the audience to investigate the matter. Whether you accept the proposition that I can was or not, I will leave it to your wisdom. I am not imposing my view on that. I have just given a thought to this. You also give a thought to this. I took you through the provisions of section 44 of the Evidence Act. Corresponding provision, as I said, is 38 of Bharatiya Sashya Adhiriyama. 44 of the Evidence Act. Any party to a suit or other proceeding may show that any judgment or order or decree which is relevant under 40, 41 or 42 and which has been proved by the other party, by the adverse party was delivered by a court not competent to delivery or was obtained by fraud or pollution. Of course, a reading of section 44 might indicate that if a judgment or decree or order is passed after contest by a court and if that court had no competence to deal with that matter, that decree does not bind the parties and that would not operate as res judicata under section 40 of the section 40 and section 11 CPC. That appears to be clear meaning. If it is a decree obtained by fraud, or by collusion, or if it is passed by a court not competent to pass it, then that would not bite. I am of the view, I am telling guardedly, it is my personal view, I am not imposing my view on you. You can examine the legal position, you are free to take a different uh, view also. I am of the view that even in the case of the compromise decree, passed by a court which had no jurisdiction at all, it would not bind the parties. We have the Family Courts Act. The Section 8 of the Family Courts Act says, if there is a family court established in that area, the regular civil court does not have jurisdiction to decide matters covered by Section 7 of the Family Courts Act. Let us take a petition for divorce by mutual consent under Section 13B of the Hindu Marriage Act. We have a corresponding provision under the Special Marriage Act also. I have forgotten the provision. Now, there is a family court in a particular area. Not knowing the establishment or existence of the family court or for whatever reason, wrong legal advice or whatever it is. Parties approach a regular civil court. File a petition for mutual consent under Section 13B of the Hindu Marriage Act. The court is satisfied that the parties were not living together for a period of one year. There are no chances of uh, they living together any longer. They have decided that their marriage be dissolved by consent. Court passes a decree by mutual consent under Section 13b, dissolving the marriage. I am of the view that though it is a compromise decree, since it is passed by a court which had no jurisdiction at all, because it was the family court which had to pass it, it may be open to one of the parties to say, this decree cannot be considered at all. I am only just canvassing it as a proposition. I am not backed by any decision as of now, but you may just give a thinking to that effect. Otherwise, 44 would say, court which is not competent. So, slightly I am digressing for the benefit of uh, the junior advocates here and for refreshing the memory of the seniors and to refresh my own memory. Basic things, we have got three jurisdictions. Territorial jurisdiction covered by section 16 to 20 CPC. Pecuniary jurisdiction covered by the local civil courts acts. Then we have this inherent jurisdiction or jurisdiction of the subject matter of the suit. It is not inherent powers under 151 CPC. 
if the court has no inherent jurisdiction to deal with a matter at all, any decree passed by such a court which had no inherent jurisdiction or jurisdiction for the subject matter is a nullity. It is void. It is non est in law. The parties can ignore it. It is called forum non judis. C O R A M forum non judis. N O N J U D I C E. Law dictionary gives the meaning of the word forum non judis is a judgment in the absence of a judge. It is true, it is a judge who has given the judgment. The effect is as if he is a non judge. A person who is not a judge has given that judgment. Though he has been appointed as a judge, he had no jurisdiction to decide the matter. It is as if a layman has given that judgment. It can be clearly ignored. It need not be challenged by way of an appeal. It can be ignored. We know this principle under the Contract Act. A white transaction can be ignored. It need not be set aside. It need not be cancelled. One can ignore it. It is totally white. As and when it is put into action, I can attack it. It is called a collateral attack. So similarly, if it is a wide decree, for I am non judis passed by a court, which had no initial inherent jurisdiction or jurisdiction over the subject matter, it can be totally ignored. No appeal is required to be filed. It need not be attacked. Even in execution proceedings, it can be challenged. It is a nullity. It is called quorum non judis. We have a very beautiful judgment at the Supreme Court on this point in AER 1954 Supreme Court 340. I know that I am slightly deviating, but worth deviating. AER 1954 Supreme Court 340. And there are a number of judgments following it. The latest in the series is 2019 3 SCC 594. 2019 3 SCC 594. If you carefully read the provisions of section 21 CPC, it would reveal that objection regarding territorial or pecuniary jurisdiction will have to be raised by the defendant at the earliest. If not raised, he cannot be permitted to raise it to the appellate. What does it mean? It is only a technical objection. It does not go to the root of the matter. But objection regarding competency of the court, inherent jurisdiction, it goes to the root of the matter. And if a judgment is given by a court which was not competent, competence not in the competence of the judge, not his intellectual competence. Competence means the authority to decide that matter. Well, if it goes to the root of the matter, it is a wide decree called forum non judis. So I am of the view, unless a decision contrary to what I have said is either noticed by me or one of you bring it to my notice, or at a later point of time a, judge, a judgment comes to that effect. Even a compromise decree passed by a court which has no initial jurisdiction will be a wide decree and section 44 of the Evidence Act would clearly come into play. This is, this is all what I wanted to speak to you. Uh, well, I have uh, Deliberately avoided some decisions of the Karnataka High Court because two officers whom I see here, they themselves know it. Uh, they can even tell me what those decisions are. I know their competence. And every time they join on this platform, I, I send the link to them. Both of them are very prompt in joining. I don't want to mention their names and cause embarrassment to them. I know them. They are really quite good. My compliments to them. Wishing all the best to both of them and all the other participants also. Any questions? I am prepared. Yes, to... sir. Yes. So this is one is if there are 10 plaintiffs, can 10 plaintiffs withdraw their part of claim? Yes, yes. They can. They can. Now, uh, what is the position of law regarding appeal or revision against the order for abandonment and compromise? As I said, <laughs> There is no appeal against abandonment at all. As far as compromise is concerned, in view of Order 43, Rule 1, M being deleted, even otherwise there is no appeal. Suit is also barred. If a regular appeal is filed, 
There it can be contended that though there was a compromise, the court did not act on the compromise. It has proceeded to decide the case on merits. That can be one of the grounds that can be urged in the appeal under section 96 read with order 41. The only remedy now is to make an application under section 151 CPC before the very court which has retarded the compromise and satisfy the court that there was no valid compromise or valid voluntary compromise. Uh, can a family settlement agreement between the plaintiff in a declaration suit in mm. which one plaintiff has re relinquished his share in the subject property be submitted to the court under order 23 rule 3 in order to delete the name of such plaintiffs from the title? Yes, yes, yes that could be done. Again, the court should be satisfied uh, that it is a, a voluntary relinquishment. Uh, please elaborate on order 23, rule 3b. Rule 3b. See, it contemplates compromise in respect of a representative suit. <clears throat> no agreement or compromise in a representative suit shall be entered into without the leave of the court expressly retarded in the proceedings and any such agreement or compromise entered into without the leave of the court so retarded should be void. See, what happens in a representative suit is, it is not just the parties to the suit. Other persons, public at large, are also affected by that. See, a representative suit is filed under Order 1, Rule 8 by one or two persons seeking leave of the court to file it in a representative capacity. It is quite possible they polluted the defendants or enter into some kind of a compromise. And the very fact that permission is given to them to file a suit in a representative capacity indicates that there is some uh, task for others also. Therefore, the law in its wisdom has said if in a compromise, if, a, if in the case of a representative suit there is a compromise, please see that public notice is given before accepting the compromise. Otherwise, uh, injustice would be done. The parties to the uh, comp uh, the parties to the uh, compromise, uh, well, there could be a kind of collusion which might affect third parties, which are those compromise representative suits. It is not just order one rule eight. The explanation says a suit under ninety one regarding public reasons, ninety two regarding public charities and trust suit filed by a manager of the Hindu undivided family. They are all compromise. Uh, they are all representative suits. Uh, well, uh, uh, and again here, since it has been asked, I am forced to cite a decision of the Karnataka High Court in this regard. Probably two decisions of the Karnataka High Court for better enlightenment. I avoided it because uh, there are persons from other states, but since it has been asked, let me refer to those decisions of the Karnataka High Court uh, which has which have explained the scope of this uh, compromise in a representative suit. Uh. <coughs> ILR 2003 Karnataka 25-59. <coughs> ILR 2003, Karnataka 2559, Siddhalingeshwar versus Virupacha Doda. Siddhalingeshwar versus Virupacha Doda, a decision of a division bench, again authored by Justice R.V. Ravindran, when his lordship was a judge in the Karnataka High Court. Then we have another judgment of Justice N. Kumar in ILR 2007, Karnataka 2894. ILR 2007, Karnataka 2894. K.S. Venkatesh versus N.G. Lakshmi Narayana. K.S. Venkatesh versus N.G. Lakshmi Narayana. What is meant by that representative suit? What is the care which the court is required to take in the case of a representative suit has all been explained very beautifully in this sense. Yes, any other question? Uh, this is... Plaintiff files a suit for declaration of a document as null and void. Yes. Suit has been withdrawn under Order 23, Rule 1 no. by the plaintiff. 
does it mean that the document sought for declaration becomes a valid after the withdrawal of the suit? Alai, has he sought uh, permission to file a fresh suit or a, a simple suit for a simple withdrawal? Simple withdrawal, simple seated, abandoning the claim. Uh, as per the question, it seems uh, simplicity of withdrawal. No, no. The plaintiff uh, has taken the risk, that's all. Yeah. Uh, next is on the YouTube. Yes. In case the suit was decreed long back, can it still be compromised at a later stage? No, if the suit has already been decreed a long back, it cannot be compromised unless an appeal is pending or a revision is pending in some court. This is uh, by Syed Fasuddin. What are the rights of the third party of if compromise is entitled fraudulently suppressing the other rights? As I said, other... certainly an independent suit lies because it's not a party to the compromise. <coughs> Actually, he can even ignore that compromise decree. But to be on the safer side, he can challenge that compromise decree by way of a suit. The Trinod not Singh case, if we carefully read, does not really bar that suit because in that suit, as explained by the Karnataka High Court in ILR 2021, which I cited, the party who had filed the subsequent suit uh, was claiming under a party who was a party to the earlier suit. It was in those circumstances, Philot Nath Singh case said, that a stranger is also barred under Order 23, Rule 3A. So, therefore, certainly an independent suit lies by a third person because he is not bound by it. <laughs> so, uh, let's assume the uh, the parties arrive a compromise in a regular second appeal. Then regular, what will happen? Yes, yes, in appeal also the parties can enter into a compromise. Parties can withdraw. Parties. Oh, the party is compromised uh, with a fraud. And that too in a high, before no, a high that, court. that judgment does not bind at all. Section 24 makes it clear. Of course, if a suit is, another suit is brought saying that the earlier judgment is a result of fraud, certainly the Principles of res judicata would not apply. It is a matter which requires evidence. Just going through the client and the written statement, uh, the court cannot come to a conclusion that it is a case of pollution or fraud. It really yeah. requires some evidence. Yes, Those were the questions that I will ask Rikram. Rikram? No. So, thank you, sir, for sharing your knowledge. It's always a pleasure hearing you. Nice. And I can see on the YouTube, the algorithm, it's as usual, it's one on the top. Thank you, sir, for sharing your knowledge. Thank you also for giving me an opportunity, for oh, no. to give me an opportunity. Oh, thank you. Thank right. You.